Um, it's great, great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Coffey for his, uh, um, his uh, completion seminar. Michael Coffey started in the lab in 2013 as an honours student and then, uh, and then went on to do a, a, a study his PhD in 2014. Michael's uh, been a pleasure to have in the lab. Um, people are probably looking at me saying, who the hell's Michael? <laughs> uh, Coffey, as we know him well. Um, Coffey uh, is a remarkable ex experimentalist. He's very careful and diligent in what he does and you can always be sure of the result when he gives it to you. He always makes sure he ticks all, uh, ticks all, uh, all the boxes, dots the I's, crosses the T's. His first year and a half was, uh, was a, a blur. He managed to get some absolutely fantastic data out and published a really nice paper. And so when it came to his two-year confirmation, it was like, this thing's flying, we'll, you know, we'll, uh, he'll get another great paper out of it and uh, he'll done a great PhD. But the, sec the second two years have been a little challenging. Um, but to Michael's credit, he's really stuck at it and, has, and hasn't wavered from this initial idea that we had. And you'll see this in his talk, and he's done, he's, he's tried really hard to get a, a, a technique, a proteomic, quantitative proteomic technique to work that is really on the cutting edge. And we didn't realise um, uh, how much we didn't know until we started doing it. And it turns out that there's not only all the technical challenges that come with doing this particular technique, <coughs> but there's also the biology behind uh, the problem at hand. And in Michael... In Michael's case, it really was that the proteins that he was investigating that were interesting, of course, the most interesting ones are always the least abundant. So that's what Michael has had to do deal with, is how on earth we can get enough material of these, uh, of these proteins, these effector proteins that are, um, we were hoping were exported into the host cell. How do we get enough of them to study? So um, I hope it's a great talk. I haven't seen it. I've been away. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm sure it will be. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, so, please take it away, coffee. Thank, thanks, Chris. Um, my secondary supervisor, Justin, has also been away. Um, told me this morning he wasn't going to come, but did turn up. So I appreciate that. And they both both sk both skipped my three year um, completion so my three year mark seminar as well, which was nice. <laughs> so uh, as as Chris mentioned, um, I'll be speaking kind of my talk in two parts today. So the first part was the first year and a half where we were really trying to establish exactly what a spinal protease five or ASP five is doing in toxoplasma parasites. And then the last two years has been more proteomic based and trying to validate the proteomics that we've been doing. So the toxoplasma life cycle begins with any feline species. So here I've just got a, a common cat. So the cat becomes infected with this parasite and then it secretes oocysts into the environment uh, through its feces. So these oocysts contain viable toxoplasma parasites and they're protected by uh, this hard cyst. These can live in the environment for several years and contaminate food and water sources and then can be ingested by any intermediate host. So the intermediate host becomes infect infected with the parasite following ingestion. The parasite then uh, emerges out of the small intestine and then uh, begins an acute blood stage infection or acute infection. This, they then form cysts in the muscle, brain and retinal tissue of these organisms and these cysts contain the long-lived form of the parasite, the bradyzoite. And then the cycle completes when the cat then repredates on these organisms, ingests these cysts and then uh, repeats the cycle. So other animals can also become infected with toxoplasma, pretty much any warm-blooded organism that's been studied, and then these can be preyed on by humans. So if one of these livestock animals is infected and then the, uh, humans consume raw or undercooked meat, they can become infected with the parasite. And then also if you ingest uh, food or water that's been contaminated with these cysts, you can also become infected that way. So the normal toxoplasma infection in humans is mild or uh, very mild if you do get symptoms, but commonly asymptomatic. If you do get anything, it might just be uh, generally like a flu in normal healthy people with, immune, with competent immune systems. Um, the parasite can infect your brain tissue, uh, so you can have essentially parasites on the brain like Chris. Um, and then these, these bradyzoites essentially survive the lifetime of the infected individual, um, but, and they're under control if you've got a healthy immune system. 
And generally, 30 to 90% of human populations are chronically infected with this form of the parasite. So around one in three people in Australia, and this gets a lot higher in countries that eat a lot of raw or undercooked meat like Brazil and, and France. This generally isn't too much of an issue if, you, if you've got a good, healthy immune system. Um, in people that go on to then have... Uh, go on to get HIV and then later develop AIDS, the parasites can reactivate, and you can see here a lesion within the brain. Um, and this is a leading cause of... Uh, it's called toxoplas uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, and it leads to encephalitic death in, in AIDS patients if not caught early and treated. The parasite can also uh, cause complications if a mother becomes infected during pregnancy for the first time. This can lead to spontaneous abortion of the fetus, or you can have uh, children that are born with congenital birth defects. So here, this, this child's got hydrocephaly, or essentially fluid or, or expansion of the brain. And then the third main way that toxoplasma presents in the clinic, mostly in uh, South America, is retinal toxoplasmosis. So here, you've got parasites that have formed a scar in the eye. And then here you've got an active infection. Um, and if this occurs close to the retina, you can get blindness in these people. So we grow toxoplasma in the lab in human fibroblasts. So essentially we just grow them on a flat dish and we add in a bit of media and they're really happy. So toxoplasma is an obligate intracellular parasite, so it needs to get inside host cells in order to obtain nutrients and replicate. And these are some videos um, made by Rebecca Stewart in our lab, who, who was a PhD student a few years ago. So here you've got two vacuoles uh, containing around 100 parasites and probably around 60 parasites here. So these are in fibroblasts, and you can see over here, this is a human fibroblast nucleus. So all of these parasites here are only around the size of a, the nucleus of this human cell. So once the parasites have essentially taken up the cytoplasm of the cell or once they receive uh, another stimulus, they can then lyse out of these vacuoles, and then what they then do is go on to invade neighbouring cells. So these are the parasites that are being released, and they want to move away from that cell that they've just killed. So the video will repeat, and you can just see that as soon as the, as soon as the host cell bursts, the parasites begin to move away because they're activating their, their really well-studied actomyosin motors. And then if you just zoom in on this part of the video here, you can see one of the parasites, as it moves away, it immediately attaches to and it starts to squeeze itself into this neighbouring host cell there. And this is a really fascinating parasite-driven event, again, using its own motor to get in. And it also um, secretes contents of these AP, uh, of secretory organelles as it does this. So if you take a similar invasion event like that and freeze it in time and then do a transmission electron micrograph, have a look at an electron micrograph, this is the parasite here as it begins to invade this cell. So toxoplasma is a eukaryotic parasite. It's got a nucleus as well as an endoplasmic reticulum and a Golgi apparatus and then several other organelles um, that, that I've been focusing on throughout my PhD. So this is the parasite here as it's squeezing its way into this host cell, which is in a darker grey shade there. So as the parasite invades, it sets up a vacuole around it, and this is called the Parastophorus vacuole, or PV, and this is critical for toxoplasma to survive. So the Parastophorus vacuole formation you can see here, just as this white halo around the front of the parasites. So they can't live uh, freely in a host cell like some bacteria can. Toxoplasma and, and the closely related malaria parasite need to set up this vacuole around them, and it delimits them from the host cell to, to keep them away from innate immune receptors, as well as helps them um, obtain nutrients, but mostly, I think, to hide from the immune system. And these parasites, so the active form of the parasite here, this is the tachyzoite, which is different from the bradyzoite, which forms the, the tissue cyst in the brain. These parasites begin modulating the host cell as soon as they invade. So this is the parasite again here. Um, these are uh, four parasites as they're growing in a, within a host cell at around 24 hours post-infection. And again, you can see this white halo mostly around them there um, is the Parastophorus vacuole that they're living within. So during my honours year, I was really interested in these Roptree organelles, which are these long club-shaped organelles. These are only injected during invasion, and they're involved in both invasion and setting up the vacuole. But it was also shown uh, around 10 years ago that proteins within the ROP trees are injected into the host cell, and they, skew, uh, they, go to the, uh, they go to the host nucleus, and they skew the immune response away from early clearance of the parasites. But they also try to make sure that the parasites don't kill the host. So they kind of have a double role there. Um, during my honours year, I was tagging a lot of these Roptree proteins. So here I was tagging them with a beta-lactamase system, and any of the host cells that are infected here turn blue, and uninfected turn green. And here I was tagging them uh, with the Cree recombinase enzyme, so uninfected cells are here in red, and when you infect them with the parasites that are here in purple, they chop out a bit of DNA and they turn the cells green. Um, and these are really nice images, and they worked really well for the controls, but all of the other proteins that I was trying to tag um, have their localization ruined when you put these big enzymes on them. 
Since then, I've more been working on the, the dense granules. So the dense granules are another organelle that are quite specific to this phylum. So these are these large electron dense organelles, and they're, they're named because they look dark when you do electron micrographs. So the contents of these organelles are constitutively secreted from the parasites and into the vacuole. And many of the changes that toxoplasma induces on the host cell are ongoing. So the parasites can infect cells for years. And it's unlikely that the contents of the rot trees, which are only secreted during invasion, could be mediating these phenotypes. So we've been really been focusing, and the whole field's most, mostly been focusing on the contents of these dense granules in the last few years. So this is a, an immunofluorescence video of parasites growing within a host cell. So you can see this circle here is essentially just the confines of the vacuole. The parasites are just these dark shapes here. And then what, we've done, or what this, this, they did in this video was they put a signal peptide onto GFP. So it traffics via the default signal uh, secretory pathway. So essentially the parasites make GFP, and it traffics via these dense granules and then gets dumped out in the vacuole out here. And you can see that these dense granules are highly dynamic, and they essentially move back and forward. That's why the field's really interested in them, because um, a lot of these proteins that modulate the host are dense granule proteins. And some of these have recently been shown to be exported into the host cell, and dense granule proteins are just called GRAS for short. So the first one of these discovered was GRAS-16 in 2013, which has really been the basis of my PhD. So in this immunofluorescence image here, there are parasites infecting host cells. So the parasites uh, on this phase image are these dark kind of jelly bean shapes there. And again, they're much smaller than these host nuclei and far smaller than the cells they're invading. So there are four parasites in this vacuole here, around eight in this vacuole, and around 16 up here. And the parasites are making this protein GRAS-16, which you can see here in red. So they're making this protein and they're exporting it beyond the confines of the vacuole and uh, overlapping with this host nuclear stain here. So this protein's made, it crosses the parasite vacuole and then goes into the host cell. And you can see that there's no stain in these uninfected cells here. So GRAS-16 appears to interfere with cell cycle progression, and it's known that if you knock it out, the parasites are less virulent in mice. So they absolutely require this protein for normal infection. So this was the first protein um, discovered in toxoplasma to be exported into the host cell, and this was around the time that I started my PhD. Um, the closely related plasmodium parasite that causes malaria has been known for decades now to export hundreds of proteins into the cell. We wanted to know whether toxo exports proteins in the same way that malaria parasites export theirs. So this is a Drew Berry movie here um, of a plasmodium merozoite, which causes the blood stage infection as it begins to invade a human red blood cell. So as the parasite invades, it, auto, it already starts changing the morphology of the cell. So you can see what, where it was once smooth, smooth and biconcave. The host cell is now starting to get these knob shapes. And this is because the parasite is exporting hundreds of proteins into the erythrocyte. Some of them facilitate nutrient acquisition and waste exchange. And you can see these are normal red blood cells flowing through the bloodstream. And this cell here that's become infected has actually pretty much become stuck to the vascular endothelium here. And that's because many of these exported proteins are involved in stopping this um, infected cell from going to the spleen where it can be cleared. So to summarize a lot of... Um, a lot of really important work in the malaria field uh, from the last 13 years, just into in one slide. A lot of this has been done at Weihai. Many of these exported proteins in plasmodium have a plasmodium export element, or PEXL. So it's commonly five amino acids, an arginine, any amino acid, denoted by this X, any, uh, leucine, any amino acid, and then either an EQ or D. So it's found 15 to 30 amino acids after the signal peptide, and it's a functional export motif. So if you take GFP and you fuse it onto a protein that has a signal peptide and then a pexel, GFP will get exported from the parasites into the red blood cell. So, and, and this pexel motif was found uh, in 2004 in Alan Kalman's lab at Weihai. So if you've got a protein that's made in the cytoplasm and co-translationally inserted into the endoplasmic reticulum through the signal peptide, the um, RXLXE pexel motif is cleaved by the ER resident aspartal, uh, sorry, uh, plasmepsin 5. And this, again, was uh, characterized in Alan Kalman's lab in 2010. So plasmepsin 5 cleaves this motif just after the leucine. And what you then get is the new end terminus of your exported protein with this uh, X, E, Q, or D, and then the rest of the protein. The protein then traffics out of the parasites and into the vacuole. But it still has to cross this parasitophorous vacuole membrane in order to get into the host cell. And it does this by passing through uh, the PTEX, so the plasmodium translicon of exported proteins. This is a really fascinating uh, molecular machine that the parasites assemble themselves. 
So it's around 1.2 megadaltons, and the parasites express this EXP2 protein, which forms the pore part of the, in the parastophorus vacuole membrane. It has several other components, as well as this HSP101, which is a, an ATP-powered unfoldase, so you get unfolding of the protein as it passes through. And I'm paying a bit of attention to this at the moment because it's quite different um, in toxoplasma, as I'll get to later. Finally, this protein traffics into the red blood cell, and there it can exert its function. So back to toxoplasma. In 2013, um, when I was just about to start my PhD, we had this protein, GRAS16, that's exported into the host cell. And we wanted to know if it was exported in a mechanism similar to the malaria pexel proteins. And in the sequence of this protein, we saw that it has this RXLXE, which is exactly like the plasmodium pexel. And we then wanted to know if the export of this protein requires this motif, as it does in plasmodium. So the first thing we did was tag it with a HA tag and look at it by Western blot. So you can see three main molecular weight species here. This top species uh, corresponds to cleavage of the signal peptide, which is required to get into the secretory pathway. And then the majority of the protein here is found as this dark band, which corresponds in size to cleavage at around this motif. And the bottom band here we think is just a degradation product. It's pretty consistent across all the Westerns that we do. When we look at this protein, so parasites shown here in red, and then GRAS16 shown here in green, you can see the parasites are making the protein, and they're also exporting it out into this space here, so the host nucleus. So putting a HA tag on this protein does nothing at all to ablate the trafficking of this protein. If we mutate these three arginines here to alanines, which is known to ablate cleavage in plasmodium pexel proteins, we see that, again, we, uh, we, we no longer get cleavage here, just like we would expect in plasmodium. So you don't see this cleaved version here. The protein appears to be slightly unstable, though, and it gets degraded. And other labs have reported on this as well when you start making mutations in this. And furthermore, when you do, this muta when you do these mutations and swap to alanines, you no longer get export of this protein into the host cell. And I've just shown a far more parasites here because it's a bit more unstable, so you can't get these nice images with this same construct. So this showed to us that you need both um, this motif for efficient cleavage as well as export of this protein. And based on the similarities to the plasmodium system, we just called this the toxoplasma pexel, or, or texel for short, which I'll be referring to it from now on. So plasmo, uh, plasmepsin-5 in plasmodium cleaves the pexel motif. We then wanted to know if uh, toxoplasma has a similar aspartoprotease that cleaves the texel. So we blasted the plasmodium uh, sequence against the toxoplasma genome, and we came up with aspartoprotease 5. Well, we were able to co-localize this with a Golgi marker. So in toxoplasma, this protease sits within the Golgi. In plasmodium, it sits within the ER. But this is probably due to plasmodium having a quite recessed and almost non-existent uh, Golgi apparatus. All of the rest of the work on this slide was done either by Brad Sleeves or in conjunction with Brad Sleeves. So what we then did was uh, lyse these parasites open, and we added anti-HA beads. And then you wash the parasite lysate over these, and you're able to pull down ASP5 with the HA tags. What we then wanted to do was uh, see if ASP5 can cleave this GRAS16 texel motif. So what you have here is a fluorophore, which is the star. You then link that to a cleavage motif. So this is the GRAS16 texel. And then you link that to a quencher. So if it's all bound up, you get no fluorescence. If ASP5 is able to cleave this motif, you get dissociation of the quencher from the fluorophore. And therefore, you get fluorescence. And this has all been uh, established, especially with the plasmodium uh, plasmepsin 5 papers. So what we then did was put in this RRL, um, RRL sequence here, and we've standardized cleavage by ASP5 to 100%. And if you mutate this RRL to three alanines, you no longer get this cleavage event. And then just to make sure that we weren't pulling down another aspartyl protease or another protease that was actually mediating this event, we made a mutant version of ASP5. So we've swapped out the aspartic acid residues that are the catalytic residues for alanines, and you no longer get cleavage. So this shows definitively that ASP5 is mediating this event. Mass spec of these cleave fragments shows that we get cleavage just after the leucine, which is exactly the same place as plasmapsin 5 cleaves the plasmodium pexel. And then Brad made Wehi 586. So this is a, a compound that's essentially a peptidomimetic. So it's got an arginine, an arginine, and a leucine here. And it directly mimics the GRAS16 RRL. Except instead of a peptide bond down here that could be cleaved by ASP5, Brad's put in a statine amino acid. So statine um, should fit in the active site of ASP5. And act, uh, sorry, this Wehi586 should sit in the active site and act as a competitive inhibitor. And this is exactly what we see. So as you dose in this inhibitor with these fluorogenic substrates, you see inhibition of the enzyme uh, with an IC50 of 63 nanomolar. So this enzyme is absolutely cleaving uh, the GRAS16 texel. We then wanted to know. Um, whether it can only cleave these five amino acids or whether we can get cleavage of, of similar sequences. 
So again, using this same fluorogenic peptide assay, Chris and Justin um, just ordered in a whole suite of, of different point mutations in these substrates to try and see exactly what ASP5 is able to cleave. So again, standardizing this GRAS16 RLAE to 100%. If you mutate the first, two, uh, the first arginine, you get loss of cleavage, even with this conservative lysine. If you mutate the second amino acid, uh, you pretty much get loss of cleavage. This is a small rescue to about 40% if you put in a lysine. Um, but again, still pretty much lost compared to wild type. And then if you mutate the uh, leucine, again, you pretty much get lost. If you start toying with these downstream AE residues, but in some cases you can get increased cleavage, in other cases you get decreased cleavage, it doesn't really appear to be as important as these first three. And then if you make uh, double or triple point mutations, again, you get no cleavage there. So we, based on this data, we decided that the Texas... Texel consensus that we were going to look at uh, throughout the rest of my PhD is arginine, arginine, thanks Justin, leucine, um, XX, so RRLXX. So what we then wanted to know was whether um, if we knock out ASP5, the parasites have a growth defect. And it took me around six to eight months to get knockouts of these parasites. So I wasn't able to do it using conventional mechanisms, and it wasn't until CRISPR was introduced uh, in 2014 to the toxoplasma field that we were finally able to get a knockout. So the way that we uh, look at um, uh, growth defects in toxoplasma is through a plaque assay. So when the parasites initially attach to a cell, they invade, they form this vacuole around them. Once they're inside the vacuole, they take about uh, 48 hours. You get around 120 parasites. They then burst out of the cell and then go on to invade neighboring cells. So when we do a plaque assay, essentially we grow our fibroblasts in a confluent monolayer. These were uninfected, so left for seven days. And then when you add crystal violet, you get this nice confluent monolayer. When you put wild-type parasites on, you get all of these holes, which are, are plaques. And this is regions where parasites have invaded, replicated, and lysed, and done this about three times. So these are large zones of clearance. When we look at ASP5 knockout parasites for the same seven days, you get the same number of plaques, but the plaques are much smaller. And that's because the parasites have some defect in their ability to invade, replicate, or lyse back out. And then just to make sure that we didn't hit an off-target uh, off protein, when we put ASP5 back into these parasites, they again can grow normally. So ASP5 is absolutely required for this normal growth phenotype. And then because the parasites can't grow as well just in a dish, we then wanted to see how well they'd go if we challenged them with a competent immune system. So we put the parasites into mice. So this is um, an infectious dose of 5,000 wild-type parasites here, which is a quite low dose um, into C57 black 6 mice. So they begin to lose body weight by around day five, and in general, they succumb to infection by around days eight to 10. If you put the same number of ASP5 knockout parasites in, they're completely avirulent at this dose, and they never lose any body weight. And then if you up the dose by a log, uh, with 50,000, you get faster death of your wild-type mice and body weight uh, loss faster. And if you put the same number of ASP5 knockouts in, again, they're completely fine. Um, and I haven't gone far higher in the doses, so I don't, I don't know exactly to what extent they're avirulent. Um, but I assume there would be some level where, where they would start becoming virulent again if you just really overwhelm the mouse's immune system. So we know that the parasites can't grow as well, and they're less virulent when you put them into mice. And then we wanted to look um, in vitro uh, and see, try and find out exactly why they were less virulent. So going back to GRAS16, this is the protein that's uh, cleaved, by a, cleaved at this motif here and exported into the host cell. When we look at this protein in the context of parasites that lack ASP5, you can see that this protein is no longer cleaved, and we get this accumulation of the signal peptide cleavage event here. And this protein is still made by the parasites, but it's no longer exported into the host cell. So you require ASP5 both for cleavage and for export of this protein. Another protein that was discovered around the same time as ASP5 and it's exported is GRA24. So this protein, again, made by the parasites shown here in red and exported out into the host cell nucleus. So GRA24 um, actually uh, activates the MAP kinase signaling pathway uh, going around the normal way that it happens within cells. And it seems to do this to get the host cells to secrete uh, cytokines that actually control the parasite infection. So some of these exported effector proteins uh, enhance toxoplasma virulence, and some of them seem to uh, help the host not succumb to toxoplasma infection. And this is one of those, those ones that dampen the immune response. When you knock out ASP5, you can see the parasites here still make the protein, but it's no longer exported into these infected nuclei around them. In wild-type parasites, this protein actually isn't cleaved, and there's no difference when we knock out ASP5 either. So when we first went into this, we thought this protein was probably going to be cleaved by ASP5. 
but it's not, and it has no RRLs in the sequence at all, so no textual motif, but you still absolutely require ASP5 for the export of this protein. So ASP5 appears to play two roles um, in both cleavage, or licensing of export of proteins, as well as um, the direct export to some extent. Another phenotype that Toxo induces on the host cell is mitochondrial recruitment. So another EM image here taken by uh, one of our collaborators, David Ferguson. You've got four parasites here within this vacuole, and you can see uh, the mitochondria of the host cell completely decorate the parasite vacuole, and they're shown up by these dark arrowheads there. So Toxoplasma actively recruits mitochondria. Uh, it's not exactly known why they do this yet. But when you knock out ASP5, you get around a 90% reduction in the amount of mitochondria. So there's one there and one there. But in, in wild-type parasites, in any slice that you look at, there may be up to 90% of the vacuole coated with these mitochondria. Um, Grant Dewson then gave us some MEFs that have MTS-GFP, so essentially GFP with a mitochondrial targeting sequence. And we can then look um, using immunofluorescence to see uh, this recruitment. And MAF1 was a protein that was discovered in 2014. It's another dense granule protein uh, discovered by the Boothroyd lab. This protein stands for mitochondrial association factor one, so the parasites make it. They release it into the vacuole here, and it pokes through the vacuole and actively recruits the host mitochondria. So the parasites um, are here, pretty much delimited by this MAF1, and you can see this recruitment of the mitochondria. When you knock out ASP5, you get loss of this protein accumulating at the outsides of the parasite, and therefore you get about a 90% loss in the amount of mitochondria that are recruited. And we see this for nearly all GRA proteins. So um, whether they're exported like GRAS16 or not exported like MAF1 and not even processed by ASP5, we generally get um, mislocalization to, to about 90% when we knock out ASP5. And then again, if you put ASP5 back into these parasites, you get normal localization of MAF1 and, and recruitment of the host mitochondria. And again, MAF1 in wild-type parasites and ASP5 knockout parasites is exactly the same. So it's not cleaved by ASP5, but you still need this protease for the correct functioning of this protein. And then the final phenotype, um, probably the most interesting one, I think, is the upregulation of semic that toxoplasma induces on the cell. So these are, these are host cell nuclei here, and this isn't a protein that's exported by the parasites. The, uh, the host cells, in response to parasite infection, upregulate the protein, uh, the transcription factor semic. So most people here would probably know it um, for its role, in, dysregulated role in a lot of cancers. The parasites um, look like they upregulate semic in these cells, probably to get extra nutrients coming into the cell. So wild-type parasites upregulate semic. When you knock out ASP5, again, you get about a 90% loss of the amount of semic in these infected cells. And then some collaborators uh, at Stanford showed uh, as well, they were actually the first ones to show that semic's upregulated in wild-type infected cells. But they then showed that if you knock out a protein that they called MIR1 for MIC regulation 1, you no longer get this upregulation. So MIR1 is a dense granule protein. Um, it's about 100 uh, kilodaltons, and near the C-terminus, it has this arginine, arginine, leucine, XX, so essentially uh, a textual motif. And then we wanted to know if this was cleaved by ASP5. So in wild-type parasites, we get around a 30 kilodalton band corresponding to this C-terminus with the HA tag. And then when you mutate this first arginine here to an alanine, you get the full-length protein, so you no longer get cleavage. So this shows to us that this, uh, this protein is cleaved by ASP5. The main reason why we're really interested in it is it essentially phenocopies ASP5 in every way. So you no longer get this upregulation of semic when you knock out MIR1 or knock out ASP5. In wild-type parasites, you get export of GRA24, which is the, the protein I talked about before that upregulates the MAP kinase pathway. When you knock out this uh, protein MIR1, you no longer get the export of GRA24. They then, trafficked, uh, they then tracked the localization of both the C-terminus, so this small part here, and it co-localizes with a parasite vacuole marker and as well as the N-terminus as well. And they, they have some uh, evidence to suggest that this protein is actually acting as the toxoplasma translicon. So if it is, um, and they haven't certainly shown this yet, but there's some nice evidence, it would be vastly different to the plasmodium system. So while the plasmepsin-5 um, cleavage of the pexel is similar to ASP5 cleavage of the texel in toxoplasma, the actual mechanism for proteins crossing into the host cell appears to be vastly different. So this is pretty much where we were at around a year and a half ago when we published the paper, and we then wanted to know if we could find other substrates of ASP5. So proteins that are made by the parasite that are, that are destined for ASP5 cleavage have a signal peptide, and this is cleaved in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, you then get trafficking to the Golgi, where ASP5 cleaves this RRLXX. 
The proteins then traffic via the dense granules, and they've got a new N terminus, and then these proteins are released into the vacuole. Some associate with the PVM, like MAF1, some are exported, like uh, GRAS16, and other proteins just seem to accumulate in this space. When you knock out ASP5, the first step is exactly the same, so you still get signal peptidase cleavage. You no longer get cleavage in the Golgi because you don't have that protease there, and then they traffic via the dense granules and just get secreted into the vacuole, and none appear to be exported into the host cell. So we then wanted to know, well, there are only four substrates uh, at the start of 2016 that were known, and we wanted to try and find extra substrates. So what we can do is take advantage of the fact that cleaved proteins versus uncleaved proteins have different chemistry in their amino termini and actually different peptide sequences. And then we turn to a technique called TAILS, or terminal amine isotopic labeling of substrates, uh, which was described in 2010. And all of the work from now on has been done in conjunction with Andrew Webb's lab. So uh, I did a lot of the bench work in association with, uh, Laura, with Laura Dagley, and then she operated the mass specs, ran all of the samples, uh, and then did all of the primary searching of these. Um, and then Eugene and Pepe have been really instrumental downstream in, in some more of the bioinformatic analyses of trying to track um, exactly where our, our peptides that we've got back fit into the toxo genome. So just some N-terminal protein chemistry for anyone that's interested. Um, within the parasites here, you have your full-length protein. So this could be GRAS16, for example. It's got a signal peptide and then this textile motif. So within the endoplasmic reticulum, signal peptidase removes this signal peptide. This signal peptide species here can then be acetylated or not. It doesn't really matter at this point. But if it is acetylated, which is just a natural capping event in the parasites, that's really important for this technique. Um, otherwise, if it's not acetylated, it can still just have this primary amine or NH2 group there. Once it gets to the Golgi, you then get cleavage of this N-terminus, and now you have two fragments of your protein. So this N-terminal part, which was signal peptide cleaved, is quite small in some proteins, or it can be the dominant species in others. And you've now got this, um, this C-terminal fragment here. And then this uh, black sphere here just denotes an NH2 group. So it's an unblocked N-terminus. In ASP5 knockout parasites, the, 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 again, the start of it's the same. You get cleavage by the signal peptidase, but then you don't have ASP5, so you've only got one isoform of this protein here, whereas you've got two when, in wild-type parasites. What we then do is lyse the parasites um, and extract all of the proteins, and then we block the N-termini of these proteins. So in the case of this protein here, which had this NH2 group, when we add formaldehyde, as well as a few other chemicals, we're able to dimethylate or block this N-terminus, just denoted by this star here. So now, all of, at the start of this experiment, all of the N-termini of all of the proteins that we've got have, are blocked. So they've either got an NH2 group or an acetyl group. And again, wild type over here and ASP5 knockout over here. What we then do is digest with trypsin, and this exposes any free amine groups. So trypsin cleaves only after arginines uh, in, this, in this system because all of these lysines have been blocked by the formaldehyde. So now we've got uh, more peptide species that arise, and this could be dozens for looking at a protein like GRAS16. So some of these have this blocked N-terminus, acetylated or dimethylated, and some have this primary amine group. And exactly the same thing happens with the ASP5 knockouts. What we then do is add in a, a compound to deplete all of these tryptic peptides. So anything that's arisen with an N-terminus that's got this NH2 group should get pulled out at this step. So we've tried a few different methods. So the first one was this TAILS method, and we've also tried using um, a, a, a compound called uh, hexadecanal, which is just highly hydrophobic. So essentially what we're doing here is trying to pull out all of the triptych peptides and enrich for anything that was the N-terminal peptide of your protein at the start. So in wild-type parasites, um, we would expect to see potentially two species. So this was the original signal peptide cleaved fragment, and this one here is cleaved after the RRL, and this is exactly what we want to see. When we knock out ASP5, we never see this fragment because you don't have the protease there. So essentially what we're looking for is the relative abundance of these peptides um, in, in the tails uh, after we've done the runs on mass spec. So... For one of these experiments, we labelled all of our proteins with SILAC, and then we looked for the unique peptide counts. So in this case, of around the 5,000 peptides that we got through, approximately 2,000 snuck through that weren't depleted like they should have been, and these are these proteins that um, were, were made by triptych cleavage and don't have a modified N-terminus. And then around two, uh, three, uh, three fifths of these, or 60%, actually do have the modified N-terminus, which can be uh, dimethylation or acetylation, which is what we did at the start of the TAILS prep. And that whole tails prep takes about five full days in the lab. 
So if you break down these modified peptides here, around two-thirds of them were dimethylated. So they, they were dimethylated by the formaldehyde when we started the experiment. And around one-third of them that came through were acetylated. So this happens within the parasites. All of these experiments were done uh, using Silac. So essentially, we grow our parasites in either heavier, light, and labeled amino acids. And then we mix them just before we start the process. So the whole tails experiment was done um, using all of the proteins pooled. And then we can look for relative abundant frequencies of our peptides based on whether they've got incorporated light or heavy amino acids. And then this is a, a, one of the tables that Laura's generated. So essentially, anything that's enriched in the ASP5 knockouts, we expect to see on this side of zero. Um, and anything that's enriched in wild-type parasites, so any peptides that come out, not proteins, um, are enriched on this side. And then on the y-axis, we've got our log 10 p-value. So what we then needed to do, based on, all of, uh, based on this data, was try and map these to, uh, protease sub, uh, try and map these to the toxoplasma proteome. So one of the proteins that I've now validated is cleaved by ASP5 is called ROP34. In blue here, this is the signal peptide sequence. And then this red arrow here is where signal P4.1 uh, uh, predicts that it's cleaved by signal peptidase. When we look at our tails plot, we see this peptide is found enriched in wild type parasites. And we see this is acetylated. So it gets cleaved at this point here. And then you've got this whole peptide shown here in red um, in, enriched in wild type and ASP5 knockouts. And that's because this is the new end terminus of our protein, and it's quite stable. When you look in wild-type parasites, we don't really see this peptide at all. What we see is this peptide over here, so this um, acetylated DSLIP, which arises after this RRL here. And we never see this in the knockout parasites. So this was a really nice example of getting enrichment on both sides, but this is one of the only proteins that we see either in, uh, enriched on both sides of the plot. Mostly we either see peptides that are enriched um, in ASP5 knockouts that are signal peptide cleaved, or we see RRL cleaved on this side. So we wanted to know uh, how many proteins could be cleaved by ASP5 in toxoplasma. So what we did was we searched um, any proteins that have an RRL in the genome. And this is approximately half of the, the proteome. So that didn't really help us narrow anything down. Um, we then focused on peptides that we found in our tails that occurred directly after an RRL. And, and Pepe and Eugene were both really important for this. So all of these peptides here map to different proteins. Um, some are acetylated, and some have this N, which is just a dimethylation event. Um, and I'm only showing these because all of these have come from the experiment that have been mapped directly after an RRL cleavage event here. So I'll be speaking about these uh, for the rest of my talk. So the first of these um, is called IST, so inhibitor of STAT1-dependent transcription. So um, this, was this was described in two really nice back-to-back -back papers in the Journal of Experimental Med last year, as well as Cell Host and Microbe. So it's been known um, for nearly three decades now that if you infect mice that are lacking interferon gamma or the interferon gamma receptor, they, they succumb to toxoplasma infection really fast. But if you infect cells, uh, infect toxoplasma onto cells and then add interferon gamma, the cells don't really activate any of the interferon gamma downstream genes. And this paper was really nice because it kind of tied in around 30 years of, uh, of work and showed that toxoplasma exports this IST protein and it binds to STAT1, which is dimerized and bound to DNA, and normally activates these gamma-activated sequences. But when IST is there, it recruits this MI2 or NERD complex, which is a, a chromatin remodeling factor, and it essentially stops uh, the, the, the transcription of these gamma-activated sequences down here. So they showed in, their paper, in one of the papers, uh, this paper here, that this protein has uh, a textile motif. They showed that in wild-type parasites, you get export of this protein out here, which co-localizes with this nuclear stain. But when you knock out ASP5, the protein's essentially trapped within the vacuole, and you no longer get export. And then just to, to finish it off, they showed that in wild-type parasites, you get cleavage um, corresponding to a size of cleavage at this textile motif. And when you knock out ASP5, you no longer get processing of this protein. So this really nicely validated that our experiments work. Uh, it was just a bit unfortunate that we were starting to tag and, and work on this protein as these papers came out. Um, another protein that we've validated that's um, been published is called ALCAT. So this is a cholesterol acyl transferase, and it's secreted by the parasites into the vacuole. Um, and it scavenges cholesterol from the host cell. So the protein is around 100, amino, uh, 100 kilodaltons. Um, part of the acyl transferase domain is here. This is the N-terminal fragment. And then down here, you've got the C-terminal fragment. And in between them, they showed that there's uh, an unusual inserted element and that you actually get cleavage of this protein within this inserted element. And then you get reassociation of the N and C-termini back onto each other to act before the protein can actually function. 
Um, we found that the, there was an RRL cleaved peptide species from our tails um, at around this inserted element region. And then I went on to tag this protein in wild type parasites. So here we've got full length, which is near 100 kilodaltons. And down here we've got this cleaved species. Um, and then this bottom band here is just bleed through from the, the GAP45 loading control. If you then go on and mutate the arginine here to an alanine, you get full length still made, but you no longer get this cleaved event. And when you knock out ASP5, you get the exact same thing. So no cleavage here, and we only get full length. And then it's quite common when we either mutate the texel or knock out ASP5 to get a bit of a laddering of our substrates, as they appear to be unstable if they're not cleaved. So what I then wanted to do was go on and tag all of the hypothetical proteins. It was nice to validate ones that had already been published, but we now wanted to know, well, how, how do these um, other hits look? So Cas9 was introduced into the toxo field in 2014, and it's pretty much completely revolutionized it. Uh, we just grow up a little bit of a Cas9 plasmid, and we can mutate uh, this 20 base pairs protospacer to cut anywhere within the genome. And then I co-transfect this into parasites uh, using just two 60 base pair annealed oligos or, or primers that we can get from IDT for around $8. So um, these are, uh, rever have reverse complementarity. So here in this region, I can add in a hemagglutinin tag or a tie tag or a knockout cassette or, or an ARL mutagenesis cassette. Um, I just heat these together and then slowly cool them over time and they anneal together. I then just ethanol precipitate them. Um, and then on each side here, these 25 base pairs are just complementarity to the genome, either side of this uh, Cas9 cut site. We then transfect these into parasites and around 10, nanogra uh, 10 micrograms, and then we can get between uh, 30 and 90% endogenous tagging after about a week. So all of the constructs that I'll show from now on inside the parasites have endogenous promoters, endogenous terminators, and everything's just normally driven. So we can essentially marker-free edit the genome um, quite efficiently using this really, really nice uh, transfection machine. So the first of these proteins uh, is ROP34. It's a predicted kinase, and I mentioned this one earlier when I showed the whole amino acid sequence of the protein. So in wild-type parasites, we get this band here, which corresponds to RRL cleaved. If you then mutate this arginine to an alanine, you no longer get the cleavage. If you knock out ASP5, the exact same thing, so no cleavage. I also tagged it in PRU parasites. So these are the parasites that we use to infect mice because it's a more physiologically relevant infection. And then I can also knock out this protein after tagging it, and the parasites are able to grow just fine, in, at least in um, fibroblasts. In wild-type parasites, this protein um, very loosely shows a little bit of localization with this dense granule uh, membrane marker, MAF1. But most of it appears to accumulate and actually sit within the dense granules within parasites. So here you've got four parasites shown by these nuclei. When you knock out ASP5 and look at this protein, you can see that MAF1, instead of being a, the nice uh, PVM localization, mostly actually sits within and around the parasites now. Um, and, and ROP34 localization is also a little bit ruined as well. So this is really common when we knock out ASP5 to see two dense granule proteins that are, are mislocalized. Another protein closely related to ROP34 is ROP35. Again, it's an active kinase. Um, here's uh, the, the protein that we see in wild-type parasites. If you mutate the RRL to an ARL, you only get full length there. And it doesn't look like there's much of it, but I've um, accidentally underloaded this. And then when you knock out ASP5, again, you get this full length here, and you get a bit of a laddering. Um, this species down here doesn't correspond to, to wild type. It's not cleaved at all. Uh, again, in wild, uh, so when we look with this MAF1 localization, you can see a bit of this protein sits uh, around MAF1 at the vacuole. And when you knock out ASP5, again, it doesn't really sit so much at the PVM, but you still get a bit of co-localization. Uh, the dense granules are a highly polymorphic population, so it doesn't really co-localize with this MAF1 protein, but it does with other dense granule proteins. So ROP34 and ROP35 are both active kinases, and we were going to follow up on those with phosphoproteomics to find substrates, but some collaborators um, over in the States are doing that, and, and we're looking to publish it around the same time anyway, so that was a bit of a win. So I then wanted to know whether if we knock out these proteins, we still have uh, the same level of virulence as in wild-type parasites. So again, infecting uh, black six mice, this dose is lower than it was before, so only 1,000 parasites, and you get um, death of the mice by around day 8 and, and all of them by around day 16. When you knock out this kinase, ROP34, uh, the mice were completely fine at this low dose. And if you knock out another protein that I haven't gone through uh, that were validated as a substrate, this putative myosin, some of the mice die, but around three out of six survived, um, and they, they lived for several more months. So when you knock out some of these proteins, you get a bit of a, a loss in uh, death phenotype. Again, this is a really small dose. So if you just double the dose, uh, the mice die faster when you put in wild-type parasites, 
And when I say die, we obviously um, have to euthanize them. Um, when you put in ASP5 knockout parasites, they were all completely fine at this dose. And then if you put in this uh, MHC, you get a delay till death phenotype, and the same with ROP34. So they don't completely protect the mice when you knock these proteins out. And we think that the loss of virulence when we knock out ASP5, which is really severe, this loss of virulence, is likely in a bit of an additive effect of knocking out or mislocalizing many of these substrates, such as ROP34, ROP35, GRA16, and GRA24, and others. And then the protein that I've been really interested in lately is called IMC2A. Um, it was predicted to be part of the toxoplasma in a membrane complex, but it's clearly not. It's a dense granule protein. Um, so it actually looks like it has two RL or textile motifs in it. Um, this one's definitely been validated, and I'm trying to work on validating this one at the moment. And it's a predicted phosphatase. Um, there was a, a recent, pu recently published CRISPR screen that looked at all of the genes in toxoplasma, and then knocking out this one uh, was really severe, so I don't think they were able to get back any parasites. So this, we're thinking this protein may be essential for the parasites. In wild-type parasites, we get two main species, so full-length uh, uh, predicted uh, RL cleavage here, as well as a secondary cleavage event, which I think is cleavage at this uh, second RL here. In wild-type parasites, you get this slightly uh, larger form of the protein, which I think is signal peptide cleaved. It co-localizes in extracellular parasites with a dense granule marker, so again, it's a uh, substrate of ASP5 that traffics via the dense granules, and so far, all proteins that we've looked at traffic via the dense granules. And then in intracellular parasites, so at around 16 hours post-infection, you can see that it sits nicely around the parasites here at the parastophorous vacuole membrane when I use this HA tag. Um, and in ASP5 parasites, this localization is a little bit lost. So I think that something that this phosphatase is doing is absolutely required to set up normal infection, and I'm trying to, um, trying to interrogate what the role of this domain is at the moment. So because we can't straight knock out this protein yet, what we uh, do in Toxoplasma is just do a promoter replacement. So we swap out the normal promoter for a TADI T7S4 promoter. So again, I just uh, clip the genome here uh, with a, a Cas9 guide, and then we just slot this in and swap out the promoter. Uh, the, the TADI system makes a TET transactivator, which essentially is made and then combined to this promoter, and then you get normal transcription of your, uh, and translation of your uh, gene of interest. So IMC2A, again, full length and cleaved. When we add in um, a tetracycline analog ATC, this binds to the TET repressor transactivator here um, and stops it from binding to the promoter, and therefore you no longer get expression. So in wild-type parasites that have the normal promoter, if I add this drug for 24, 40, uh, or two, one, two, or three days, you still get the normal levels of protein made. When you swap out the promoter for this TADI promoter and look at the same protein. The protein um, stops getting made over time, and there's only a really small amount here. And the parasites also seem to, to be reduced as well. So either they're not able to grow as well or they start dying. So I'm trying to follow up uh, this at the moment. So these are the known textile cleave proteins that have been published so far. Uh, and these are the ones that we've just found by tails. So th these are the only ones that I've talked about so far. We've got a, a bit more of an extensive. but. It's nothing like the hundreds that we see in plasmodium parasites. And that may just be because, as Chris said, they're, they're really low abundance. Um, and it also, it also may mean that there's just not as many proteins exported in toxo as there are uh, in plasmodium. And then two of the main proteins that I spoke about at the start, so GRAS16, which was really my model, as well as MIR1, um, which is involved in that translocation of effectors. They're both cleaved by ASP5, but we've never seen the, um, the RRL cleaved versions by tails. So it may just be that they're too small, there's close arginines and they don't fly well, or, or that we could still optimize our uh, technique a little bit better. So I just wanted to finish by uh, comparing and contrasting plasmodium export versus toxoplasma export. So as I said at the start, proteins that have a pexel in plasmodium are co-translationally inserted into the ER. They're cleaved by the ER resin and aspartoprotease plasmepsin 5 after the leucine. The mature protein gets put into the vacuole here, and then it needs to cross the vacuolar membrane through this PTEX translocon, which is made by the parasite. And then you get export of this protein, and there's hundreds of these that are exported. When we first started um, this project in 2014, none of the export pathway in toxoplasma was known, and only that GRA16-1 protein was exported. So we now know that proteins in toxo that have this RRL also have a signal peptide. The signal peptide's cleaved by signal peptidase. You then get trafficking to the Golgi, where ASP5 cleaves this motif, and this is required. This cleavage motif is required for proteins like GRAS16. Again, the same position as in Plasmodium, but the consensus motif is slightly different. 
You then get trafficking of this protein. Most sit within the vacuole, um, but some are exported, and they're exported potentially in a mere one-like fashion. So there doesn't appear to be any kind of unfold days and this large machinery over here. So whatever's going on in Toxo is probably a lot more simple than in Plasmodium. And then finally, you get export of some of these proteins into the host cell, and all of the ones described to date go to the host nucleus. So Toxo exports proteins into the host cell via this evolutionary conserved mechanism that we see in Plasmodium as well. There's evidence that it may be in other apicomplex and parasites. So ASP5 licenses several of these by direct processing at this RLXX or Texel motif. Um, but export and trafficking of other non-processed effectors, such as MAF1, which recruits the host mitochondria, also require ASP5. Deletion of ASP5 uh, in the type 2 strain, that PRU strain that I was showing before, makes parasites avirulent, at least at the doses that we've looked at so far. And translocation of effectors across the PVM into the host cell uh, is not a conserved mechanism. So this is d obviously different in Toxo versus Plasmodium. And then finally, this TAILS method that we've been using has been really uh, helpful, and it's uncovered novel substrates of ASP5 that are required for this normal infection um, in mice. So with that, I would just like to thank uh, my supervisors. So Chris is my primary supervisor, and I've been in his lab for the past four and a half years, as well as Justin, who was um, my co-supervisor at the start of my PhD and was really involved in, in a lot of the Plasmaps and 5 work. Um, Alex Uboldi started the project uh, as, I, as I was joining, as well as pretty much taught me everything in the lab, so that's been um, an outstanding help. Brad did all of the work um, in trying to characterize where ASP5 cleaves and making the peptidomimetic compound. Danu's uh, in Alan Cowman's lab, and again, he works on plasmepsin 5 as well, so he's been really uh, instrumental for bouncing ideas off, and uh, we went behind our supervisors' backs at one point and tried to put the plasmepsin 5 into toxoplasma, and, and it didn't work at all, and it was just a big waste of a few months, but it was a bit of fun. Um, as well as Simona and Shiraz as well, who I should have put up here, also work on ASP5, but more so in a mouse setting. Um, my committee, Stuart, Jeff, and Alan, um, for turning up to some of my meetings. <laughs> um, the, everyone, um, so in Andrew's web lab, Andrew Webb's lab for the mass spec, particularly Laura, as well as Andrew, Eugene, and Pepe. Um, in, uh, two years ago, I got the Run Melbourne Travel Scholarship and went over to Stanford, where I went to Alan Ye's lab um, and worked with Katrina Hong to, to um, learn this tails technique, which was really helpful, as well as our collaborators at Stanford, John Boothroyd, and in his lab, Nicole and Mike, who were on our paper, and they were involved in finding this um, MIR-1 phenotype. Uh, Carolina in the mouse rooms has been, um, as everyone knows, they're, they're absolutely fantastic in there. Uh, Putbon. Um, family and friends, as well as uh, everyone that comes to curry on Wednesdays, and, and Vishal, who serves us our curry, and is <laughs> an absolute delight. And, um, and the, the travel scholarship for attending the Toxo meeting earlier this year and um, presenting some of this work overseas. And then lastly, uh, the Wee High footy team, so where the current premiers of the, the Parkville region uh, had an absolute, absolutely fantastic team, and they really helped me get through the last few months, so thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Coffee. I was expecting some more embarrassing photos. Sure. Up there. Uh, have we got any questions? <laughs> Andres. The, the regulation, upregulation of MIC uh, in response to the infection, is that transcriptional or post transcriptional? I think it's transcriptional, um, although I don't think anyone's absolutely looked at that. Um, I, I think there's some evidence to suggest that uh, this GRAS-16 protein, one of the first ones that I talked about, that's involved in, it directly binds to uh, PP2A and uh, HORSP, herpes-associated ubiquitin-specific protease. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how it all works, but they're still trying to unravel the direct mechanisms for how all of these interactions work, but I, I'm not certain. Thank you. So, for those uh, potentially lower than targets, do you think, do you just need to optimize the protocol or do you need a totally new approach to try to find some of those? Um, I'm not sure what, what alternatives for totally new approaches would be. Um, we've tried several different things. So we know that these proteins in the dense granules are constitutively secreted, even if the parasites are outside of cells. So we've tried to stimulate the secretion of these proteins and then isolate the supernate and concentrate that down and try that. And we got a couple of hits that way but not as many as, as when we did intracellular parasites. I think they're just, they're just low abundance. So um, another thing that we could try and do is subfractionate just the dense granules. Um, so you can do that for some organelles. I'm not sure that anyone's tried the dense granules. And something we've spoken about, but we, we kind of realized that 
we weren't getting enough hits a bit too late to try and start a whole new organelle fractionation technique. Yeah. Um, so the S5 knockout, you can culture that um, in vitro. Yep. Um, what happens when it goes in vivo, though? Is it just immediately cleared, or is it persisting but not causing symptoms? So they can still, yes, uh, so they grow at about um, half the rate of wild-type parasites. So when I pass my normal parasites, I might pass a mill, and ASP web knockouts will have to pass twice as much just in, in tissue, uh, in, in vitro. When we put them in vivo, um, we haven't specifically looked to see whether they're still present. We've got some um, competitors, or collaborator competitors. Um, <laughs> So all, three groups published on uh, this ASP5 knockout at the exact same time. Other groups have more looked at the in vivo phenotype, and they say that the parasites still make it to the brain and are still able to persist there, um, but I, I haven't looked at it. So we, we think that they still are able to get into these cells. They just can't modulate to the same extent. Um, but so presumably if they persist, they, you couldn't use them to protect against no. another infection that was well cut. So I have done that um, with, with low doses. and Yeah, so I have challenged ASP, uh, mice that we've injected with ASP5 knockouts and then put in wild-type parasites, um, and they've been completely fine at the doses that we've tried, but we haven't, we haven't really followed up on the, the mouse system so far. So Simona and Shiraz who are in the lab are more looking at the in vivo stuff. But they are, to some extent, a uh, potential vaccine candidate, but probably in conjunction with another protein. Um, so Alex Uboldi is working on some some stuff with potential vaccine candidates for live vaccines. Any other questions? Justin. Coffee, something I thought you might mention, but you didn't, and I can't get angry with you at that because obviously I didn't come to your practice talks, but <laughs> <laughs> was the um, really interesting link, potential link between MIR-1, this translocon of the vacuole membrane, and the twin arginine system, right. which translocates folded proteins across bacterial membranes. And the fact that there's two arginines within this motif, mm. and so whether or not there's some potential way that this motif could be signalling for that, even though it's been cut off. Sure. So whether or not the cleaved parts of the protein somehow remain attached to these proteins as they traffic, because that's, there's lots of precedent for that. And, sure. and also whether or not there is a, a, a structural fold for these proteins, given that they may be folded as they're translocated. Um, so do you have any comments there about how proteins might translocate? Not really, no. So, I mean, when we, when, we, when we first started looking at this, exactly as you said, the, the, the two arginines that could be involved in this twin arginine translocation are cleaved in the Golgi. So we weren't really uh, looking at those to be exported or trafficked into the vacuole. Um, we now know that um, ALCAT as well as uh, MIR-1, that both the N and C termini are there and they, they all traffic together post-cleavage, so they could be involved. Um, no, it's not something that we've looked at, and I think that's probably more something that the, the Boothroyd lab's looking at, not more than us, but yeah, it's, there's a potential for that, sure. Oh, one more, last one. Last one. So, um, have you ever looked at like cleavage substrates for plasma T5 and plasmodium, and if so, have they, they used, like, when they have? Did they use tails? Because I don't seem to remember hearing anything about tails. But why, why, like, tails for toxic, or tails for plasmodium? Sure, yeah, um, so Danu's doing that at the moment yeah. for plasmaps and 5 oh, and plasmodium. <laughs> yeah, for, for tails, plasmaps and 5, ah. plasmodium, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was just a bit of a guinea pig, and now that I've kind of blundered through two years of doing it, I think they're just going to sweep in and get some really nice substrates. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So what Coffee didn't show you is that he summarised, you know, a good, you know, almost year and a half of slogging away at a protocol to try and get that to work. Um, so uh, this is Coffee's swan song, and uh, I'd like you all to congratulate him on a fantastic PhD and all the best for his uh, future endeavours. <laughs> <laughs>